All right. Well, thanks for coming back to the Bigfoot Society podcast. I have the privilege of having Dr. Uh, Jeff Meldrum with me today. So thank you so much for agreeing to come on, doctor. Um, we're going to start out by, uh, by reading through his uh, uh, bio from Idaho State, just so that everyone knows exactly uh, what we are in for here. So Dr. Jeff Meldrum is a full professor of anatomy and anthropology at Idaho State University since 1993. He teaches human anatomy in the graduate health professions programs. His research encompasses questions of vertebrate, evolutionary, morphology, generally, primate locomotor adaptions more particularly, and especially the emergence of modern human bipedalism. His co-edited volume from Biped to Strider, The Emergence of Modern Human Walking, Running, and Resource Transport proposes a more recent innovation of modern striding gait than previously assumed. His interest in the footprints attributed to Sasquatch was piqued when he examined a set of 15-inch tracks in Washington in 1996. Now his lab houses his lab houses well over 300 footprint cast attributed to this mystery primate. He conducts collaborative laboratory and field research throughout North America and the world, such as China and Russia, and has spoken about his findings in numerous popular and professional publications, interviews, television, and radio appearances, public and professional presentations. He's author of things such as uh, Sasquatch Legend Meets Science, which explores his and other scientists of evaluations of the contemporary evidence and also affords difference to tribal people's traditional knowledge of the subject. He also has published two field guides, one focusing on Sasquatch, the second casting the net more broadly to consider the potential of relic hominoids around the world. And he's also editor-in-chief of the scholarly journal, The Relic Hominoid Inquiry. That's a lot. That's a lot. It's probably the longest bio we've ever had, but well, yeah, you, you should have edited a little bit, but that's fine. Yeah, well, you know, some good uh, jumping off points there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. What's your uh, What's your favorite part? What are you most proud of in that in that bio? Oh, oh, gee, I haven't been asked that. That's a new question. Uh well, that's hard. I, I'm terrible with favorites. Uh, okay. Favorite, because uh, you know there are pros and cons to every aspect of that. There. There, uh, you know, I'm I'm the type of person who's a generalist, maybe more so than uh, than a singular specialist. I mean, when I put my mm. mind to something, really go all out into it and deeply into it. Don't mean to say that, but I'm I'm the type that likes to kind of follow where my curiosity and where opportunities present themselves, rather than force the circumstances to some preconceived program. And I've been criticized and complimented for that quality <laughs> as an academic and, and as a person. But, uh, you know, I mean, I, I think that I have pointed out some interesting, interesting aspects of uh, the evolution of hominid bipedalism, some that have gone unacknowledged or unrecognized. But mm. uh, now, finally, after beating, the, you know, a drum for 10 or 15 years, yeah. you to see people acknowledging and citing and recognizing that hmm, maybe you know they don't come out and say it but but implicitly Mel, maybe Meldrum was right after all and <laughs> likewise, with Bigfoot you know holding the door ajar you mm. know I if if someone like me had not sort of stepped into the lane and and grabbed that baton from Grover Krantz I'm afraid the door would have really uh, uh, resoundingly slammed shut as far as the academic community went. I agree. Um, yeah. and, uh, you know, so if I'm a voice of uh, even the lone voice in the wilderness, um, I mean, I, I should point out too, uh, now that I said that, that, uh, that, that may be just a matter of perception, that there's a lot mm. of interaction I have with my colleagues and other academics, uh, both here in the States and, and around the world. Who, um, who behind the scenes have a deep-seated interest and curiosity about this question, but they're just not in a position either because of their, um, their you know, professional uh, discipline or emphasis, mm -hmm. their research to pursue it, nor are they at liberty to pursue it openly. That's why you oh, see yeah. so many gray-haired retired types like, like I'm getting very close to <laughs> 
um, who suddenly take on an apparent interest in Sasquatch. It's been there all the time, yeah. but they haven't been at liberty to discuss it openly um, uh, in their academic circles. So, yeah, um, I'll tell I you, just, it's I, extremely hard to interview scientists about Bigfoot. Like, I have a thing where I try, and I would say for every, you get one yes for every 15 no's because did people you know they want to keep their yeah. job to be honest sure but, oh sure absolutely yeah. and uh yeah it, it it can have a it can have a very uh chilling impact mm. you know and especially for young academics i i mean i i sense a thawing of the uh attitude there there are more uh, more um nods to the, the mm. of relic hominoids. You know, I can use the term and discuss with my colleagues the prospect of persistent species of hominin, you know, or, 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 or ape uh, under the auspices of relic hominoid. But as soon as the word Sasquatch, or especially Bigfoot, comes to the fore... Sh shuts down. I yeah. Think, Ooh, yeah. Don't talk yeah, about that. that. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So it's... Uh, but but still, there's about we're we're, all, we're about a generation not a generation about a decade away I estimate for really? that generational shift. Oh. To, I'm I'm getting more and more interaction with young academics just getting their PhDs and uh, you know landing positions and so forth who on the sly acknowledge that they are very interested or you know uh, keep in touch with me. Okay, you that's know, cool. Advise them. You got to kind of. No, yeah. keep it until you yeah. have job security. I mean, that's one of the reasons for for tenure is to mm. provide you with some academic freedom that there isn't unjustified repercussion for pursuing a topic or a question which is not perceived by the consensus as acceptable. Mm. And it's just interesting. I, I just served on a, a a subcommittee for our faculty senate to reevaluate and rewrite our academic freedom policy on campus. Really? And the, the com yeah, the committee member or the uh, committee chair specifically asked me because of some of the experiences I've had on campus to wow. participate. In. And it was interesting because there was a point where uh, one of the members, and I don't think it was an intentional, I, I don't think she really realized the implication of the verbiage she had lifted from another document incorporated into her summary statement. But it made the statement to the to the uh, to the uh, sense that um, that um, faculty had the responsibility because we, we had a responsibility of it for academic freedom statement. Faculty had the responsibility to convey content in their courses that was generally accepted by their discipline. Oh and wow, said, that's yeah. crazy. Said, yeah, I said that's wow. just wow to what we're what we're talking about. Oh you know, man. This, this isn't a progress in knowledge through consent, no. not a democracy, you know, <laughs> a very lively conversation about that. And she wow. quickly acknowledged and recognized she just hadn't really read it that way. And, uh, you know, she saw it from what she was perceiving as being the other way that you have some, some then control over, you know, wild hairs on the faculty mm -hmm. uh, that don't get off uh, in the weeds, but, Hey, even that sometimes is a is a uh, stimulating uh, uh, circumstance to have students engage in conversations, even about topics that are sure. that are a little bit out there. But anyway, that so yeah, yeah it's interesting. Oh, it's an interesting uh, dimension, which certainly has impact on the way that uh, uh, this topic is perceived by the. You know, as, as Dr. Krantz would say, the scientific establishment. Fascinating, fascinating. Um, do you mind, as my email said, do you mind if we talk about Star Trek for a bit? Um, oh, no. So oh, I've, I've heard this from multiple, a few people, and they're like, you got to talk to Dr. Meldrum about Star Trek. I was like, he's a big Star Trek guy? And they're like, yeah, totally. And I'm like, hey, if he's up for it, that would be kind of cool. So, and everyone listening to this is like, are you kidding me? But it's okay. We'll get to the Bigfoot stuff in a little bit. Just settle sure. down. Um, so what is Star Trek? Like, how do you define, what is this Star Trek thing? What is, what is it for, for me? What is it to you? Yeah. In general. Oh, well, yeah. I mean, I grew up, I mean, that, it was, who, who didn't 
uh, of our generation. That was that was the the vehicle to get beyond the horizon to to imagine what it would be mm. like, explore strange new worlds, to seek out new life and new civilizations. You know, to boldly go. I mean, you know, I mean, I can remember racing home. Uh, because they were doing the reruns in the afternoon, right about 3.30. It was like 3.30, 4.30, or 3, or 4 to 5 before the news. And I remember racing home before we went out to play uh, during that that stretch, we would watch Star Trek. My brother and I would watch Star Trek. So sure, we, you know, and I've got my, you know, remastered original set on DVD. And and, uh, I remember at a conference uh, at dinner, afterward the conversation turned to you know just what was the basis of life what was the boundary mm. between inanimate and, and the chemical basis and i made some off the cuff remark about the horta and someone said do you know what the horta is <laughs> i'm guessing that's a big like star trek reference <laughs> i know and so and so they stand up and said hey everybody dr Meldrum knows what a horta is <laughs> that's amazing so anyway, oh my goodness. Yeah. I love but that. I think I, as I mentioned to you, I, I was invited to um, here at Salt Lake City. They had their first uh, Comic-Con. Exactly. And they, uh, I was invited to, to give a talk. And so I tried to, you know, the, the, try to play to the audience a little bit. And how could, yeah, yeah. I, how could I kind of fold that in so that a cryptid had a little more... Um, solid position and it didn't take much i mean the the connections you know and you, and you could also satisfy not only star trek but star wars so i had oh uh, uh, oh i had some you know uh, <laughs> I, I did a remake of the cover of my book instead of uh, instead of those sasquatch eyes i had a cut out uh, oh you had la forge a crop or... no, no i had a, a cropped uh, image of chewbacca's face oh I mean, that's awesome yeah totally Chewbacca oh, so good. Prince instead of sasquatch oh my goodness print. And of course, my my topic, you know, the theme, the whole Star Trek theme was to seek out new life. And, Mm. you know, still are corners of our globe that are unexplored or or that need further exploration and new forms of life are being discovered both on land and in the sea. And so uh, there's, you know, some parallel themes that uh, tie zoology. So it was fun. It was well received by the, by the, uh, by the audience and the, that's awesome. What is your, uh, what's your favorite? So there's of course, different series of Star Trek. Is there a favorite oh, one yeah. that stands out to you? Oh, I'm, I'm, I've got to be, uh, you know, I'm, I'm dedicated mostly to, uh, the original series. Okay. Although, um, although Star Trek enterprise was, I, I really liked the way they did that. I had a hard time with, uh, the next generation, the first season. Really? I, I couldn't watch it. Oh, I wow. still Watch episodes from the first season. It took them a while for those characters to mature and get rid of a few that didn't belong on the bridge, <laughs> based on their behavior and personality and emotional profiles. But uh, um, but there there were some that that were 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 really really quite good. I I'm not a cable TV person, so I've only seen a, a little bit of the uh, Star Trek Discovery series. And uh, again, it just you know, it's always risky when, when, when you when you were, were weaned off of the original, then then you can never get away entirely from comparing to mm, those yep. and those and those exactly. relationships. And so it, there's always a, a little bit of disappointment sometimes. But uh, wow, um, yeah, it's, it's fun. It's a fun uh, franchise to to uh, you know. It's so it's so funny when you think about it when you when you set aside the 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 special effects and the spaceship and mm-hmm. and that it's still the plots all boil down to just human relationships you know the oh writers, yeah totally but you know it's all all drama and uh, every once in a while there there's some interesting twists I always like the time travel uh, paradoxes and things like that you know? I was it, just gonna ask like do you have a favorite scene um favorite scene well you know actually one of the most poignant uh, where I, I think they really reached in deep in, into the emotional response is the um, the episode where uh, in Star Trek Next Generation, okay. uh, I, think, I think it was actually a two-part, where they encountered the probe, which connected with Picard. And oh, the, lit- the Borg, right? Life. Pardon? 
the Borg, right? No, no, not the Borg. No? Okay. It was a probe sent out from a civilization that was about to succumb to their oh, star. Oh, snap. Okay. And he learned, that's where he learned to play the recorder. Oh, you yeah, 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 yeah. And then after this, this he, he li literally lived vicariously in, in a second lifetime. Mm. Um, this experience, then when they brought the probe on board and opened it up, here was a, a little case that had that recorder in it. And, you know, can you imagine what it would be like to live two lives? I mean, to have, to live an entire life and close it out. Yeah. And then suddenly wake up and realize you still have your own life to finish out. And That'd be crazy. I just thought that was really quite an interesting. Uh, yeah, that's very, cool. Poignant ending as he retired back to his uh, ready room with that recorder and uh, reflected on that whole lifetime of experience that he'd had mm -hmm. in a you know very vivid dream vivid state. But uh, anyway, there's all kinds of things like that that are interesting. Oh yeah, I always like the scene in Star Trek VI where it's like the the president's about to get shot and they're like oh save the president and they all rush inside and like just at the last minute like you know kirk like right. jumps on him and like yeah that's a pretty right, sweet right. scene <laughs> yeah uh yeah. so how how do you make the uh can you teach me how do you make the vulcan salute do you have a how do i make it you mean just yeah. do, you know i like this just come naturally yeah i mean <laughs> that's right nice yeah. nice um no, that's nice yeah, I often end my emails with that now. After we started the, a that's lot awesome. Of, you know, live long and prosper was a good good wish in in these times of uncertainty. So. Oh, that's true. That's that's true. Uh, Greg from the uh, Patreon, he so he's going to call you out specifically where he asks, if you had to choose Kirk or Picard, who are you going to choose? Oh. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. Uh, well, like I said, Picard really matured into into his role, but I still would have to go with Kirk. I mean, I'm a purist, okay. so I have to stay yeah. with Kirk. Makes yeah. sense. Although I think I, I think more often than not, I relate more to uh, to the Spock character. Uh, when mm. I was, we had a, a pair, uh, a couple of uh, or a guy, a friend of mine that I always seemed to hang out with. And uh, and he was a little more bombastic than I was. I was a little more intellectual, a little more reserved. Sure. He was more bombastic. He was a few inches shorter than me. <laughs> so he struck me. It, it struck me even then that we looked kind of like Kirk and Spock, you know. Oh, that's and, awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So not that anyone ever called us that, but uh, that was <laughs> <me>. <laughs> All right. Are you ready to get into some crazy Bigfoot questions? Oh, sure. You're Always. ready for whatever it could be. All right. So yes. uh, the first one is, so my buddy, Jonathan, you actually had shared a, uh, a photo from him on Facebook, like a, a few days ago, but he's like, he's like, you got, you got to look into this. So um, it was the, it's the photo where it's like a, a gorilla next to Patty. And right. he's like, can yeah. Dr. Meldrum comment on Patty's right thigh? possible yeah. herniation a difference in hair what do you think right well right there there was there's always been some some uh, attention drawn to some of the irregularities in the surface of the apparent irregularities in the surface of the skin and the explanations have varied uh, from from the um, interesting possibilities to the absolute ludicrous that mm. it's a pocket in a pair of waders and and Hieronymus didn't take his car keys out of his pocket, and that's what's bulging. That's <laughs> that's Bob Hieronymus, not Tate Hieronymus. Hieronymus for right, everyone. Okay. Yeah, just we'll clear right. that up. <laughs> there you go. And uh, of course, it was it was actually Doug Highcheck who drew attention to what uh, he thought could be um, a, a herniation, mm. and I started doing a little looking into that and uh, being an anatomist. And discovered that indeed there is this condition where the fascia lata, um, in the lower extremity especially, the deep fascia that encompasses the muscle compartments, is much thicker. It's stouter. It's a it's an adaptation to um, assist with creating intracompartmental pressure to help milk the venous blood, which is under low pressure, oh, wow. upstream against gravity to this heart that's way up there. I mean, it has to you know go up three or four feet. Yeah, true. Uh, we'll call them. That's why we have the one-way valves in our in our veins. Well, that that thick connective tissue sheet—it's like support hose, but under the fat layer. 
um, sometimes can break down through disease. Tuberculosis can cause damage to connective tissue or through a traumatic injury, uh, a penetrating wound. And this was the funny thing. We, I used to, uh, we had the, uh, a lecture in my um, physical therapy and occupational therapy gross anatomy course. Okay. And at the very end, we had, we used to have a lecture where we would uh, spend a part of the class reviewing. And then usually that would kind of taper off. And I would then use um, the Patterson Gimlet film as a way mm -hmm. to get them to think about surface anatomy and muscle groups and so forth. And wow. action relates to um, uh, gait. And so I would show this very uh, high quality clip that was produced from the color channel separation mm. um, scanned images, which lent tremendous clarity to, to uh, what the result. And then uh, uh, MK Davis had uh, strung those individual frames together and stabilized them and, mm -hmm. and played them, uh, set them at, at the proper film speed, you know, about 16 to 18 frames per second. And sure. so it's just mesmerizing to watch this loop. Mm. And uh, you know, I would project this up on the screen so that it's uh, not full size, but it's pretty, pretty big. And you could uh, watch the details, remarkable details. And, and I pointed out this quadriceps herniation and this student raises her hand. Oh, oh, she said, I have that. I said, what? She said, yeah, I was, I was years ago, I was bucked off a horse and we were out in the brush and I was wow. bucked and landed in a brush pile and had this big stab wound in my thigh and the fascia lata never quite healed properly. And she happened to be wearing gym shorts, you know, cause we go into the lab and they wear their scrubs over their gym, over their, their clothes. Uh, and so sometimes they wear athletic wear just they don't want their nice clothes in there in the, in the wet lab. But so she could demonstrate, she just, she uh, simply flexed her quads when she was walking, <laughs> she took a step forward like a lunge and boom, this golf ball sized bulge, half, half golf ball, you know, uh, pops up under the skin on her thigh. And then no when way. she slips right back in, just, just exactly like what you see on the film. Oh, wow. Or in addition to that one singular bulge, there are other sort of irregularities that, that people have uh, rationalized must meet just a, a poor job at packing the padding under mm. the cloth of the costume. Well, it's interesting because a lot of the lines and dimples and bumps that you see are at find you, you can easily find correlates in human examples. And uh, this is the paper that I've often referred the readers to. Bill yeah. Munz and I did a paper on the skin and adipose tissue as inferred from the Anderson Gimlin film. And, mm. and Bill had gone through and and called a number of, of pictures of just regular pictures, irregular people rather, not models, but middle-aged to upper-aged people that he actually <laughs> gleaned from websites for uh, naturists of uh, uh, oh, wow. locations, you know, camps where where people were walking around, you know, you know, al fresco, and uh, and when there wasn't a lot of uh, toned bodies and and mm -hmm. life was sucked and etc. Um, you could see the normal wrinkles and dimples and grooves and so forth, mm. muscle groups and fatty areas and fascia. And the congruence is just remarkable. Then I went through and culled through uh, just images on the on the web of uh, great apes, of chimpanzees and gorillas particularly, sure. and, uh, and showed similar patterns of, um, you know, the way the skin hangs on the back in a bilaterally symmetrical way. And, you know, Bill had shown that, that similar folds on a fur cloth suit, if it's just like a pajama top, when there's a fold, it, it will often run all the way across the midline to the other side, you know, not have that draped look where it's tacked oh, yeah, down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. And processes of the back, you know, of the spine. And so, and so that was quite, I was quite intrigued when someone posted that image with the red circle because it mm. showed some irregularities in the in the fatty tissue or you know whether they were you know lipomas tu tumor fatty tumors or whether they were just right. you know um, just uh, uh, the natural appearance of of, uh, 
uh, a little excess adipose tissue on a, a gorilla in captivity. Right. You know, in the wild, they often don't have the excess of, of uh, food available that they can become obese. But the great apes in captivity can take on or can become obese through their sedentary lifestyle and and overeating and they lay on lay down fat sub q fat just in the same pattern that humans do oh that is fascinating yeah them. it's just that you, you don't often see it in the wild wow and just just as you don't often see obesity in mm. in hunter gatherer society you know right right these are more of the premium oh very so cool it's interesting i mean i it's important i think to not be not have a, you know on the basis of a snap judgment say oh that's fake and mm -hmm. here's what but say hmm, what could explain these different uh, uh, appearing aspects and when you consider them in concert with everything else and there is an explanation that is absolutely biologically sound and appropriate i mean to me that's the more parsimonious explanation than to concoct some scheme of somebody having created a costume and and incorporated right. anatomical exactly. details to compel into experts in the field. Oh so. man, that's an interesting answer. Thank you. Uh, thank you to Jonathan Easley from Western Bigfoot Exploration on Instagram for sending that in. Um, next up, this one gets really intense. So. Okay. Yeah, get ready. So Josh, uh, my buddy Josh, she was from the Patreon. This is his question. If multiple DNA samples collected from an area were to be matched to one another to exclude the possibility of contamination, present genetic markers that belong to the hominid line and contain a clearly identifiable mDNA profile of a species and the homo genus, would that be sufficient proof to genetically establish an ichnospecies of the homo genus? Oh, okay. Well, oh, that, that that's an easier question, I guess, to, to answer than I thought he was going to get it. Some <laughs> it's process. a lot easier for, for you to answer yeah. than for me to read it. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, when he mentioned the mitochondrial, you know, the, uh, the, okay. The, okay. Like yeah, affiliating yeah. the mitochondrial genome to a, a human, a homo sapiens, which is part of the argument that uh, Melba Ketchum and her mm. adherents have have proposed as evidence for hybridization to account for the origin of Sasquatch. Mm. And let me just say that there, I, I find no uh, merit in those arguments or no uh, credibility. Gotcha. But um, but boiling it down to the question is if we if we just to say it in in shorthand if we found sure. a novel non-human primate genome on the north american continent would that be sufficient that is a, a question that that uh, is uh, open still mm. uh, there is no precedent that i'm aware of of acknowledging a entirely novel species on the basis of dna alone now dna has been used to maybe segregate closely related species say from museum specimens where someone notices some consistent distinctions between two populations and then, so they go ahead and take a little snip off of this pelt of, of some of those museum specimens and test them. And sure enough, there's, they, uh, they discover that by their uh, standards or criteria, there's sufficient differentiation to call them different species or, or different subspecies or whatever. There's a precedent for that, but those specimens exist. The physical specimens are in museum drawers already. So uh -huh. that's kind of different, but there's a growing body of literature and discussion in the professional literature about the, um, the uh, notion of acknowledging a novel species on the basis of a novel DNA sequence, especially as it pertains in conservation situations to rare and endangered species. And even more, more especially the, the, uh, as it applies to species that have long lifespans and social structures that the taking of a live specimen may have mm. a significant impact on the dynamics, on the social dynamics of, of uh, that group and its survivability. Sure. So Bigfoot might be a interesting and interesting um, test case of that uh, proposal mm. of a 
you know, on the basis of DNA alone. But I tell you, there, there's just so much controversy surrounding this topic at this point. Oh, yeah. My gut reaction, my suspicion would be that short of a physical specimen, a very uh, significant specimen, either a corpse or a, a skull, um, that uh, that acknowledgement will won't be forthcoming without you know that conclusive uh, piece of physical evidence. It actually that leads quite perfectly into the next one, which okay. you can probably guess what it is. Okay. Um, so, uh, Greg. Um, from uh, Patreon Order sixty six uh, Star Wars podcast says, uh, so what what would you do if you came across the mortally wounded Sasquatch? A mortally that, wounded. That's a tough. That's a tough question. Well, I'd probably sit down. I mean, uh, if I, if I was in a position to render assistance, I I, I would perhaps uh, sure. venture to try that. I mean, but when you're dealing with any animal, mm. especially one that's potentially you know eight feet. 1200 pounds and it's wounded <laughs> not mm -hmm. very good yeah. um uh, you know under any circumstances i think one would have to be very very cautious yeah but i really wouldn't uh, go home i would i would wait <laughs> until uh such time as maybe the possibility of collecting the specimen if it was sure. mortally gotcha say, gotcha yeah. is uh yeah. it presents itself but uh but yeah no i'd stay i mean these people who turn tail and run home after um, mm -hmm. an encounter I you have to wonder I mean I can I can appreciate the impact that it has on on people especially when you're alone there's a different mentality when you're alone than when mm. you're with. Oh, that's yeah. interesting yeah that's a that's a tough call I think it, it definitely comes down to how how you view uh what what Bigfoot actually is I I personally well, sure. am looking at it as it is a unknown uh great ape in North America, but there's many different ways to look at that, you know? Well, so. right. Yeah, sure. Yeah. I mean, if that, if that was what they were, they were after to make that right. distinction, that's, that's yeah. a whole different uh, conversation. And totally. Let me just say, because so many viewers, they, they pigeonhole me and, sure. and the label, uh, they're not the label, but the, the assertion that I think it's, and I put this in quotes or emphasis, I should underline just a mm. great A. First of all, anyone who uses that expression has no appreciation for the uh, the nature of great apes. Mm, I, I, I agree. Yep. spent time not in the wild, but under circumstances where I could interact uh, to a great deal and and closely interact with with great apes and and fully appreciate what a magnificent animal they are. I mean, mm. all animals. I mean, you you can have some of those same experiences with your your, uh, you know, your, your dog or your cat or, or your true. Uh, cockatoo, you know, uh, we, we have long as a society underestimated, I think the intelligence and the, and the uh, sentience, if you want to use that word, the uh, consciousness of, of animals, but, um, but I've never pigeonholed. Yes. I've used the term North American great ape and so forth, sure. but as others have pointed out, while we don't really consider ourselves great apes we are hominoids that's why mm -hmm. i like the word relic hominoid the, the term hominoid it has it has two references um when Porshnev coined the term he used the term hominoid in the vernacular meaning man-like and uh but in a more precise taxonomic sense it means a member of the superfamily hominoidea which includes us and all of the apes, the, from the lesser to the great, the gibbon and sea among and the uh, orang chimps and gorillas, um, and ourselves. I mean, we're part of that super family. We, we're split off separately in the hominini in a tribe. We even share mm. the same family hominidae with the African apes. We're in the same family. And so, you know, it's, it's splitting hairs. It's quibbling over something uh, you know, getting the horse before the cart before the horse. Right, right. Yeah. We, we can we can discuss what it is after we prove that it exists. Yeah. Well, there you go. Yep. Silly totally. to do it beforehand, but but you know what what I'm suggesting is that the difference is 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 uh, is just one side of the fence. It's not a long ways away from the fence. If it is on the hominin side, it's a very early offshoot, like a paranthropus, a robust. Uh, yeah. 
the scene yeah. or something like that. Something that predated um, a consistent, sophisticated stone tool culture that we can recognize in the archaeological record uh, of, of significant brain size. And that even that has been quibbled in the history of anthropology for a long time. What was the what was the cutoff for humanity? You hmm. know, and, and Arthur a uh, hundred years ago kind of put it at 750 cc's. Well, the robust Australopithecines come in there just about 50 cc's bigger than a chimp or gorilla at about 550. So it's a couple hundred shy. And even when we start talking about absolute volume like that, you know, there's differences. There's differences that don't necessarily mean anything about intelligence because they just have to do with relative body size. Sure. You know, so, so, you know, pygmies in Africa have a different cranial capacity than, than you know, somebody, you know, these six foot six um, uh, American football players. You know? <laughs> well, let's see, maybe not. No, no I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, I mean, that's a whole different episode right there, but I get what you're saying. Um, there's, so there is actually a, uh, there's a rift in the, the crypto zoology community about you. So I, I need you to, to pick a side. So there is one camp that is mustache, Dr. Meldrum, and there's one camp that is beard, Dr. Meldrum. So which, which side? Well, the, the mustache right? must be, they, that must be newbies watching reruns. Then. It is. It's monster quest. Dr. Meldrum, isn't it? Yeah. 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 Well, uh, I'm afraid if, boy, if I, if I, I wouldn't recognize myself, uh, I'd be like <laughs> right. those YouTube videos where the dad cuts off his beard and drops the yep. towel and the baby starts crying. If I saw myself in the mirror, I might start crying. <laughs> <laughs> my chin, it would have, it will look like either my chin has melted into my neck or I may discover that I've actually got a couple extra chins that I've oh. didn't really there you go there steps. you go yeah you and me both yeah um, well, the one the, the one that i don't care for though i probably shouldn't even say it but is but is the oh, occasion boy. suggestion that the dark mustache I've, I've been called it looks like a cop's mustache which i don't mind so much but i've also been it's been suggested that i look like a particular porn star with that dark <laughs> well i, I mean i wouldn't know <laughs> i don't know where we can we i'm can speechless leave that one. We can I'm leave speechless. that one back yeah. in the dustbin. Wow. Well, cool. I mean, uh, you never know what people are going to bring up, right? <laughs> that's right. You never yeah, know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> what is, what's the one thing you wish you had known when you started your career? Oh, gee. Yeah. That's a tough one. Um, yeah. You know, I don't, as I look back, you know, people often ask me if I would, if I had it to do over, would I do this? And mm. I mean, I, remember that there was literally that that fork in the road and it it happened when i was kneeling down looking at these 15 inch tracks in the mud there and outside of walla walla washington mm. in 96 and uh you know i had just come from dr krantz's office uh wow. this interest of mine that was you know began as a youthful interest had become quite latent and uh, and it was only because of a, a series of circumstances that it had risen to the surface again. And mm. and I was involved in, in a documentary to evaluate uh, a piece of video footage, which I had kind of taken on as just a fun exercise, you know, like a, a little sure. Sherlock Holmes, you know, sleuthing the clues to. And I, I thought it'd be straightforward to point out the zipper. And it wasn't. And that got the wheels turning again. And. And I had just visited, I went up with my brother to visit Grover Krantz. And so I'm, I was very keenly aware yeah. of Dr. Krantz's um, career and the impact that his interest in this subject had had, had all back then. And I mean, he, he was admittedly a bit of a maverick and a bit of a um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, out there thinker on several things, many of which likewise uh, proved to be quite prescient, uh, his, some of his outlandish ideas. Not all of them, but I mean, you throw enough spitballs against the wall. And some, <laughs> yeah, Sounds good stick, yeah, yeah. But I can remember having that 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 moment that uh, of introspection as I'm kneeling there looking at this, and thinking, you know, what do we do here? Do we do we uh, go down this road? And and I, I've often described it was almost like the little cartoon imp on each shoulder. Of the oh ones. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. You sure you want to do this? You know, this is. Hmm. And, 
and the other one saying, how could you not? How could you? It wasn't really a devil <laughs> and an angel. It was just the two alternate realities. Right, exactly. From this right now. And, and of course, that one won out. How could I walk away? I mean, I'm a scientist. And yeah. here, here, in my estimation, is the most compelling evidence I've ever considered on the subject. And there were no ifs, ands, or buts really about it. I mean, mm. I mean there was no ambiguity. Let's put it that way. There was no, am, no middle ground. It either was hoaxed or it wasn't. Yep. And I think I, I think I have enough uh, wherewithal and savvy and experience when it comes to interpreting footprints, given that's what I've spent an awful lot of time and oh, energy. Sure. Yeah. So, so here we are. Wow. Fascinating. Yeah. What are the uh, best resources that have helped you along? The, I guess you could call it your Bigfoot journey through your career. Yeah. Well, let's see. I mean, you certainly, you can't, do what I was able to do without funding. And oh, uh, I didn't even think of that. Yeah. <laughs> the prospect right. of attracting extramural funding for this kind of a project. And so I, I do owe a debt of gratitude. There was a philanthropist who, uh, oh, wow. an interested person, and uh, who uh, uh, gave a, a very generous award that helped myself and mm. working at that time with very closely with uh, and consistently with John Mianzinski, a wildlife biologist in Wyoming. Mm. And, and so it, it funded our research efforts uh, to a significant degree uh, for quite some time. We were able to get um, night vision monoculars. Oh, yeah, sure. The camera equipment and, and, uh, and the, uh, you know, just the logistical things that allowed us to spend long periods of time out in the field, you know, so mm. I, had the opportunity to, to, you know, every summer to spend at least a month, um, wow. sometimes a whole month in one place, uh, researching and, and doing that. So that that was an important part. Um, the other is just, I mean, it's, uh, I guess, well, uh, that's hard to call. You know, uh, some people in the past, I think, have made the mistake of being entirely reactionary. Okay. And, and that's necessary. And th that is, you know, they wait by the phone until someone reports a sighting uh, or yeah. race out and chase it down. And that's, that, that is a strategy. I, sh I shouldn't be critical of that, but I think it was important. I'm glad that I had the opportunity to get out and do um, proactive research, to look for things, find them uh, myself. And, mm. and we've, we had some successes. I mean, there have been opportunities to... Uh, to find footprints in the field on several different occasions. I've heard vocalizations. I've had things visit our camp, you know, and stuff wow. like that, tents. And um, so, so we've had those minor successes, but just not the, you know, not the real uh, uh, brass ring. <laughs> mm. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. D uh, can you think of maybe a, a particular book that was very influential in, um, as you were coming up through the years sure. that you really relied on? Oh, yeah. The first book I ever asked for okay. as a Christmas gift, you know, from Santa. Sure. Yeah. Was Ivan Sanderson's uh, ah. uh, Do a Balmal Snowman. Uh, no, not, I mean, uh, um, uh, A Balmal Snowman Legend Come to Life. And I devoured that. I mean, I read mm. that multiple times as a kid. And, and, you know, as a pretty young kid, I was probably six sixth grade when I got it. Oh, wow. Uh, read that through. I mean, that's how I learned geography and, and was fascinated with maps and plotting things uh, and uh, understanding the uh, terrain where the, the, the habitat for these ABSMs, as he referred to them, his acronym for abominable snowmen. Um, and uh, so it was, it was, uh, that, that certainly had uh, probably uh, a, a significant influence and then shortly on the heels well right right about the same time i guess because it would have been just before that i got uh, roger patterson's book i, I had attended okay. showing of the film in spokane in 68 and wow the really book. right oh man and then the third one i think was the you know those first three were really the significant ones was john green's on the track of the sasquatch because mm. it turned out that uh, my librarian at my elementary school 
was John Green's niece. And what? she had and spaking new copy of his book that he had just sent down to her when I was oh, doing man. report on Sasquatch as a sixth grader while we did our unit on primates. And she had his book and a whole filing, uh, clippings file with newspaper and magazine articles that she had accumulated because of uh, uh, her interests, her family's interest, you know, her uncle's interest. In, in wow. The so those three, I think, were the were the three. And I still have those. I still have those. Uh, you know, oh, you still have like the original copies? Oh, like, oh, yeah. oh that's so oh, cool. Yeah. That is so cool. Wow, very cool. Uh, I I can't imagine like the synchronicity or the like you being oh, related like yeah that's yeah. weird man like it, I know it's crazy in, in hindsight in hindsight you know and I say if for anybody who ends up somewhere yeah you know in hindsight it seems that the stars kind of align but yeah. you know it, if if you step back and you you think about the circumstances that that dictate which which forks in the road you select it really is pretty amazing and uh, yeah it's some of the circumstances and coincidences that happen uh are mm. really uncanny I mean, they really are. so um yeah it's been it's been an interesting ride um yeah what was it like uh, oh go ahead yeah no i just i'm just gonna say it's been an interesting ride no matter what the outcome oh is. yeah Totally. But I always tell people uh, that that you know not to expect to go out on a on a weekend and, and solve, mm. and that you you need to cultivate an enjoyment of the process. Yes, yes. That uh, yes. that is uh, just as much an important part. That's why I get a little disappointed. You know, we were actually um, uh, discussing the possibility of of um, you know doing something on television and and how could it be done differently and okay. one of the conversations i was having with the producer was you know the people who were watching the the real loyal audience they're interested in the process you know it's a big joke that sure. find bigfoot after what 12 seasons hasn't found bigfoot that's fine but if you followed them, yeah. you, know, you got to visit all of these different places. You got it's to hear such a cool, it's cool. All these different people, you know. Yeah. And I, so I was here uh, this morning. Actually, was was watching some old episodes that I had not seen. As I said, I'm not a cable guy, but since we've got our Fire Stick plugged in and we subscribe to a couple of stations, I can catch up a nice. little bit. And uh, when they do that, when they actually show you the process, it's interesting. It's disappointing when they gloss over the process. Mm -hmm. There was one episode, and I won't mention who's doing what, but they were in a cave. And there were yeah. actually bones. There were deer bones, probably. But they just kind of, oh, yeah, deer bone. They walked on. Well, that's the whole reason to be in the cave, is to look for remains. Look right. for, that's right. where Gigantopithecus teeth were found when a porcupine carried a jaw into a, into a limestone cave, chewed it up, and the bits got fossilized in the in the limestone, the alkaline environment. Oh, of the yeah, limestone. yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, that's so crazy. that's what, you know, it, it's the process. They did bring mm -hmm. in radar and they were mapping the inside of the cave and that was quite interesting, but it's always superficial. They always flash these images that don't really convey anything except the impression of what was done. And so, you know, I was trying to impress the producer that you need to do something that's more of a documentary style rather than this mm where you build up to the commercial break and the right you know, oh man attention is all is the only thing that you're after for ratings i said the ratings will follow the ratings will follow if you give them meat on the bones but true true we'll see. We'll yeah see you'll have that. to um they did a new special there's actually a new finding bigfoot special on discovery plus you have to check it out it's pretty the expedition cool. bigfoot no, no. Uh, Finding Bigfoot came back for special. Oh, oh, on, um, oh I see. On okay. Discovery Plus, yeah, it's pretty cool. Yes. They go to West Virginia okay. and stuff. Oh, all right, okay. Um, so, do you remember what what um observations do you remember from seeing the the film in '68 at that presentation? Well, yeah. When I when I reflect back, um, yeah. it's interesting what you remember and what you don't remember. Not a right, lot of exactly. Impression, even more than they make a memory. I, I have flashes mm. of the visual. I mean, of course, when that when the 
patty, if we can call it that, was walking across the screen larger than life. I mean, we were in that yeah. call of time, that gigantic projection screen, and I and uh, my father and I and my brother were on the third row, and so it was larger than life walking across that, and then wow. it started in the close-ups, and it was just amazing. I mean, the mm. other there were just bits and pieces that that made impressions, but it was always, you know, that was the main impact. Wow. I think, uh, uh, Mike Rugg ha had come upon a copy of the theatrical release of that film, that documentary, oh, wow. the showcase, and, and he showed it at one of his conferences that I spoke at. And it was interesting because I didn't, it was like, in some ways, it was like seeing it anew because, yeah. although that had such an impact on me, I, I, you know, I was only 10 at the time and, and uh, uh, there were a lot of parts of it uh, that uh, I, I didn't remember at all. Interesting. Oh, that's interesting. But it was mostly the, it was mostly that, uh, that film clip. Seeing that, that was the. That's center. awesome. Yeah. Yep. Um, what have been the, uh, what would you say the top three people that have been influential to you over the years are? Oh, yeah. Hmm. Let's see. Well, the list could have been longer. I had some unfortunate interaction <laughs> with a few people that were uh -oh. <laughs> extremely disappointed. Well, maybe positive. <laughs> But yeah, we'll go stay with the positive yeah. ones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just saying that it uh, sometimes people don't realize the impact that they're having on someone. Oh, that's a uh, good lesson. Yeah, I think. Yep. Well, th th yeah, this this is a great story too. The the first okay. opportunity, uh, short story. The first opportunity I had to present some of my findings mm. and uh, and conclusions was based on the uh, what became known as the Redwoods video or the Playmate video, also known as. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And that was up at Harrison Hot Springs. And um, I got up there and was uh, had been told that the arrangements had been made. Of course, the arrangements had been made for my travel and so forth, being a speaker. And uh, But when I got to the front desk, there was no room for me. Oh, they no. They booked up. Oof. No, nothing. No cancellations, no nothing. And I so I, I jokingly said, well, hey, can I at least camp on the beach down by the lake? And, you know, here, here on the, on the lodge grounds. <laughs> and I hear this voice from behind me says, don't be ridiculous. You know, you're coming home with me. I turned around and it was John Green. Whoa, and, cool. You know, and so, you know, I just was, uh, you know, starstruck. And so I got to spend that entire weekend as his house guest, you know, uh, on the downtime between conference sessions and to boot, his other house guest was none other than, none other than John Bindernagel. Wow! So what to the, you know, to the persona, uh, <laughs> on a personal level, um, than to spend my evenings with those two, and that's where we discovered. That so cool. That's where we discovered that uh, my librarian was his niece. Oh he started, wow! He goes, you know, how did you, how do you know so much? Because because I I had. You know, when at that age, when I got interested in a topic, I was a little bit obsessive and, and really dug deep, as I said, even though my interests would bounce around. And so I had my own, you know, in, in, and also in preparation for this report I did, I did a lot mm. of research, but I, but I did lots of things. I, uh, uh, you know, I, 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 in addition to clipping newspaper articles and finding magazines and so forth, Going looking on the microfilm at the library, you know, yeah. I uh, when when the uh, documentaries would come out, uh, we'd wait until they came to the drive-in theater, and then we would record the soundtrack oh. on a little cassette recorder. Oh, that's so cool! Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you could listen to or it. Or even I even awesome. smuggled when I got a smaller one. I'd smuggle it into the, the to the uh, into the uh, movie theater, and I would record those, and then I would listen to them at night. To, I, I would that's fall amazing. Into to rock and roll music, but listening to that he always follows the creeks, you know, <laughs> the soundtrack to the legend of Boggy Creek and <laughs> and the, the the creature of Black Lake, you know, and so forth. Wow. So, oh though, man. We didn't we didn't have copy machines, and so when I would check out a book from the library with a passage about the abominable snowman, yeah. I would sit on yeah. mom's typewriter and with two fingers type out that transcribe that section and that is have it amazing in. so i could so i you know would learn these things really thoroughly so john was 
how do you, you know, he was very curious. And then I told him about doing this report and, and that Miss, and that Miss, uh, or that librarian, I couldn't remember her name, I just said librarian. And he said, well, do you remember her name? And I said, no. He asked which school it was, you know, Indian Trail Elementary in Spokane, Washington. Do you remember your the library? No, I don't remember. It's been 40, not 40 years, 30 years, 20 years mm. back then. And uh, he said, was it Mary Bessaker? And you know, when someone says it and you, yeah. you remember the familiarity, oh, yeah. can he draw? And, and immediately he, he, he said, well, that's my niece. And he reaches oh. over and he picks up the phone, dials her number. Hey, Mary, you'll never guess who's sitting across the table from me. You remember wow. that little who was the first one to check out your book and she did she remembered so that is so cool it was just really amazing oh man um there's something i want to ask you about uh i i'm gonna i'm gonna really put myself out there because i can't verify what i'm about to ask but we'll see if this is actually a thing okay so so be nice if i'm totally off but um I, I think I remember hearing Danny Perez tell a story where there was a group of you that took a car down to the film site. Is that actually a thing? And it was like you and um, right. some other people. Right. Well, it, the occasion was the dedication, the grand opening of the new wing of the Willow Creek Museum. Okay. And in concert with, I think the, the conference was held in, in concert with that or I may be conflating two events, but in any case, there was a conference at the uh, Willow Creek Museum and, uh, and it in, included a field trip. Mm. And so I rode a bus down with one of the groups and uh, you know, hooked back up with uh, the rest of them. They're, they're, I got a nice portrait with me and Danny and, and Bob cool. and a whole yeah. bunch of Dimitri, Dimitri Balyanov was there. Yep. Uh, so on John Bindernagel was in the picture. Oh my goodness. And, uh, and we got to actually go down there and I was right there at John's uh, or uh, Bob Gimlin's elbow as he, I mean, this was his first opportunity to be back. Wow. And so he was remembering back all those years. Oh man. From the place. And you know, the place was overgrown with alders uh, when we were there. It uh, was very different when he was there. There'd been a couple of seasonal uh floods rather uh, severe floods that had scoured sure. the, the uh, creek bed and opened up that sandbar so you could see patty walking across the the open wow. terrain there but all that sandbar had been overgrown with alders and, and it was pretty uh, thickly um, vegetated oh, so it was hard awesome. but it was interesting to see him remember you know remember landmarks big trees or or oh, uh, rock outcrops and so forth and they were pretty sure that they were darn close to the spot where that's so occurred. cool that's really yeah it was cool. interesting to be there i scooped up a little sample of the sand oh yeah film canister both as a memento but but also i actually when i when i uh did the ichno taxonomy mm -hmm. of the footprints and we na named the footprints i had a colleague of mine who's a uh, physical geologist do a formal description of the geological and chemical characteristics of the sand of the sandbar in which the tracks were made you know and he made the comment wow. that, uh, he said you know it's interesting because the sand was not uh, granite kind of quartzite type of sand it was uh, a very eroded uh, shale and very angular grains which when compacted and when moist really held their shape and that's mm. why the footprints were so clear and oh, could man. be seen this is that went there even weeks, if not months after the fact, and still see the trackway proceeding wow. across the, uh, you know, it was, yeah, it was, it was quite interesting. That is really, really cool. Um, as you know, there's a, there's a ton, like the interest in Bigfoot right now is extremely high. I would say over the last few years, it just keeps getting crazier and crazier right. and crazier. Sure. If you're thinking about the uh, current, generation even younger than i am um yeah. 20s 18 around there what are what are the skills that the next generation really needs to focus on in order to be effective bigfoot researchers right well um i mean there's so many facets to the yeah. research and that's one of the challenges of of appearing to be the only 
academic seriously involved with it is, I mean, one of the one of the hats I do don is is a kind of um, ringmaster, if you will. Mm, yeah. <laughs> if you yeah. want to call it a circus, it feels like a circus sometimes. But <laughs> trying trying to direct resources and personnel towards sure. particular topics, or rather direct the topics to people who can um, have an impact on it, whether it's bioacoustics or whether it's DNA analysis or whether it's hair analysis and so forth. Um, and so in an individual researcher, if they, they can certainly educate themselves in, in a variety of, of ways. You know, when I, sometimes when I speak at conferences, we, we add on some uh, workshops. And I've done this as a, as a primary topic of presentation okay. as well, just kind of a footprints 101. Oh, wow. Yeah. And, um, you know, what is it that, uh, that we we're looking at and, and what's the nature of the dynamic signature of a foot step, not mm -hmm. a print of a static foot. Totally. And, uh, I, there, there's been a, uh, an upsurge as well in um, misidentification of bear tracks, for example. Oh, and bear, interesting. Uh, bear sightings, bear photographs. I mean, yeah, you can go online yeah. and uh, look for, you know, Bigfoot photos. And, and, and I, I was, for this presentation I did on bears and Bigfoot, the, the similarities and differences. And so, you know, I, I easily pulled out uh, more than a half a dozen examples that have been attributed of uh, photos that have been attributed to Sasquatch that are absolutely clearly bare, you know, prominent amongst those, the Jacobs photo, which has created all kinds of heat, and very little light in the conversations about it. Um, but anyway, you, you know, there, there are such tremendous resources available to someone online. I, I point out that being able to differentiate a bear from a Bigfoot, it's really not rocket science. I mean, it does take a knack for, for noticing detail and so forth. But with a little effort, you too can <laughs> do this at all. You, you too know? can. <laughs> yeah. You know, you can create your own atlas, your little, your little uh, right. atlas of, of Bigfoot tracks by, by just Googling, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Bigfoot tracks. Uh, no, bear tracks. That's was, that was where I misspoke. Bear tracks by Googling bear tracks and, sure. and oh, yeah. Oh, and put together and get get familiar with the differences. Now you may need someone to kind of walk you through to really notice and recognize the distinctions, but but uh, it won't take you very long to be able to tell the difference. Mm. And there are some again also some embarrassing uh, situations where people who should have known better have for whatever motivation, uh, either naivete, ignorance, or um, sure. deception, have uh, attributed. Bigfoot or Sasquatch status to what's obviously a bear print. Wow. Um, so that's one. I, I tell people again, you know, you, you pick out an area close to you, kind of a rule of thumb, since we're talking about bears, there's been a very interesting paper published that shows remarkable similarity in the estimated range of Sasquatch with the known range of black bears. Really? Various bioclimatic factors and, you know, and so on. And it makes sense. I mean, it's not really yeah. a surprise because you've got two large omnivores and, okay. and well, their, their uh, preferred resources uh, certainly are, uh, are distinct, but, but overlap. And uh, anyway, but the point is, so a rule of thumb is, I think is a starting point, a reliable rule of thumb is, are there black bear in your selected study area? If there's mm. not, if there never have been, or they've been extirpated because of of population growth and, and development and expansion and you know impact and hunting and so forth, then uh, if a bear can't make a living in that spot, it's not very likely that a 800 or eight foot, uh, 800 thousand pound Sasquatch. Yeah, that's smart, yeah, yeah. Social unit could as well. But once you've got that narrowed down, then just get familiar with it. Instead mm. of tripping all over thinking, you know, thinking that the grass is always greener on the other side, it's right. better to get familiar with an area that you can spend time. Oh, man, people, yeah. Encounters are serendipitous, right? By chance. People who, you know, so it's, it's like winning a, lot, winning a lottery. Uh, mm -hmm. You won't win unless you buy a ticket, right? The more tickets you buy, That's the true. more tickets you are. So the more time you can spend in the field. That was one mistake I made early on in, in my efforts. Okay. We, you know, 
we, I was trying to network with a lot of people sure. to um, maximize the um, eyes and ears and hands and feet that were you know, employed in this mm -hmm. effort. But in the process, we would spend an awful lot of time and, and resource traveling to these far-flung uh, areas in the Pacific Northwest and so forth. And then realized that, hey, there are lots of reports right here in Eastern Idaho and Western mm. Wyoming oh, yeah, that we sure. focus on and spend, like you said, spend more time, weekends and so forth, uh, up, uh, checking things out. And so that's what I encourage people to do is cultivate uh, research and familiarity with their own backyard, if you will, understand Ugh. the animals yeah. there. It's, you know, become a naturalist, become a, an amateur naturalist and, and enjoy doing it. That is, man, that alone right there, that is worth the price of listening to this podcast, which is zero. Um, but like, that was amazing. Like, oh, that's awesome answer. Thank you. Um, is there a thing that you wish, so here's the thing I, I found out about you. You do a lot of interviews, like hats off to you. You are all over the place. Like you really get on a lot of stuff. Is there a thing that people never ask you that they wish you wish that they would bring up or? Uh, uh, no, it's kind of all over okay. the place. I try, even when I get the re repeated, uh, standard right. cards, I try yeah. to put a different spin on it each time, but yeah. yeah nice. Uh, you know, uh, it, it's hard to know, uh, <laughs> or hard to answer that. I can't think of specific things. I mean, sometimes questions are very specific. Something's just happened, mm -hmm. you know, like with the, the footprints that were found up in uh, British Columbia, mm. that are the rounds now on, online. And this set, you know, a, a footprint in the mud. Mm. And uh, so I, I responded on Facebook and post, okay. I mean, I, someone shared it with me, thankfully people, People do send me things and, and sometimes, you know, they preface it with, you probably already know about this, but I'll send you anyway. And no, hey, I appreciate it. I don't have the time to sit oh, there with that, yeah. bolts all the time. And so, like I said, more eyes and ears sharing, sharing exactly. things that are going on. But this, someone shared this with me and I took a look at it. And at first glance, you know, it was described as huge footprints. Well, huge footprints that were a whopping 11 inches long. Ooh, That's yeah. you know, on the mm. upper end of human, but not quite. And they, right, they, right. they were measuring to the outside of the extrusion of the footprint. And so mm. instead of down inside where the actual foot width was documented, it was only four inches across, not six or seven inches across. And uh, it had an arch. It had uh, the human toe disposition, you know, the big toe. And, and then the uh, little toes are much smaller pads that angle down and um and so forth there was a very distinctive heel imprint i mean it was a great opportunity what i try to do on my facebook page is take those circumstances and and bend them to a teaching opportunity sure, and sure. educate a little bit uh, as well and yeah. uh, not to put down anyone or anything oh but, yeah no but to but to educate and uh, um and so that was that was an interesting one. Um, those kind of questions are, are always good to bring things up to speed, and um, you know, it. Uh, I don't know. Hey, that's fine. It's a, it's, it's an awkward swing question. in the kitchen, I guess. <laughs> it's an awkward question, and sometimes it lands, sometimes it doesn't. So don't worry about it. It's fine. <laughs> but sometimes it gets some really crazy stuff. But um, yeah. what are the top yeah. books that someone just getting into Bigfoot should like? get on amazon like today yep well you got to get sasquatch legend meets science i mean oh i mean same. number one right like that's that's the thing right <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, and i'll put a plug in for my field guide that has turned out to be a real useful little tool because totally like I said it uh, and not only for um for uh, you know more experienced seasoned outdoors enthusiast who get into this but it's been a great tool for kids as well Oh uh, yeah, pretty fun too. So that when kids go out in the in the forest, they're looking for sign and they're asking questions about uh, footprints and and nests and different things mm. that they find. So I always enjoy that kind of feedback. Um, other books, well, it kind of depends on what you're trying to do. I mean, if you're trying to re really get a sense of of uh, the of what 
I believe Sasquatch is, books like um, John Bindernagel's uh, mm -hmm. North America's Great Ape to Sasquatch is great. Yep. Uh, Robert yeah. Allen's Rainco Sasquatch is great. Oh, yeah. From a historical perspective, you know, Chris Murphy has, has done a fantastic job with his Meet the Sasquatch and Know the Sasquatch. I'm a very visual learner. Mm. And so, uh, you know, a book that's replete with all these historical photographs. Yeah, yeah. Photographs is just a, an amazing uh, treasure trove of information. Um, <clears throat> of course, the classics like uh, John Green's, uh, his his trilogy, plus then the uh, uh, the Apes Among Us is is a really a mm. must read thing. Um, you know, Sanderson's is a classic. It's one that you you have to read uh, to say that you've read it, and you'll you'll still gain a lot. And he's got so many such an archive of, of accounts to the extent they're, they're reliable. You know, there's always a question sure. about the reliability of some of those uh, anecdotal reports, but, uh, but, but there are things, there, there are problems. Grover Krantz's book is still great. Mm -hmm. uh, introduction to footprints as well. Um, you know, I've re really stood on Grover's shoulders in, in many ways, many, uh, many aspects and, was able to push forward and I think correct tweak tweak a few misconceptions that he had I mean his specialty was he was a, a very accomplished anatomist and physical anthropologist but he wasn't a specialist in in footprints and so we had some enlightening conversations about the Bosberg tracks and about mm. you know the uh, mid-tarsal uh, break uh, and so on um, well, you know, there. That's a good list, though. Yeah, that's a good starting yeah, list. That's a great. You have to be oh, careful oh, because man. lately there's just been a flood of books, and I oh, do. Really? It is. Oh, that's, yeah, that's true. Sometimes I'm a little critical uh, because, you know, people in this day and age where it's easy to self-publish, yeah. um, people think they can just write a book. I mean, it always bothers me when any, even a professional author you know, deigns to assume to write a book about a topic that they've never had any experience. You know, oh, sometimes dear, yeah. first to pick my brain and I'm thinking, you know, this, <laughs> I should be spending this time writing, working on my book, not talking to you, you know, oh, starting snap. from, <laughs> they could have a, and sometimes they, they, it's evident they have not done any research at all on the subject matter yet. Yeah. Uh, there was a whole flurry of skeptical books. You have to be careful of those. They're good to read, to understand the skeptical point of view. And some of them actually do do some good research. Uh, you know, uh, Prothero and um, the Abominable Science book, it's called. I can't think okay. of it. The co Lockstroman, Prothero and Lockstroman. Um, it's a travesty, but they did do some actually did some research in the bibliographies of their chapters have some some good mm. primary sources but you have to take what they say about those primary sources with a huge grain of salt because so uh, much of what they say is so slanted or so taken out of context or so cherry picked that it's just it, it is abominable science i mean they couldn't have put a better label on it but wow. they're abominable science not those of us that are trying to apply science to the subject matter and there was a whole string of them. Um, it uh, you'll have to you know look up some of my book reviews because I'm, you know I'll I'll uh, I'm very frank and very blunt with my reviews, um, especially when people set themselves up. Um, I can always confuse which one it is, whether it was McLeod or uh, uh, Blue Booze, but <clears throat> they wrote a book. I think it was Blue Booze. Um, on the cover, he has a couple of hairy mucklucks with, you know, <laughs> with toes on them. Uh, right off the bat, there's a, a, a bias present. But right. in his foreword, he writes, um, you know, his previous book was about the natural history of ants. And it took a lot of research, he said. I had to really study to write this natural history of ants. So for my next project, I wanted to do something that wouldn't require, you know, that kind of rigor. Uh, so I thought, well, how about Bigfoot? There is no science to study. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, he, he, the whole thing is, is just this, uh, uh, you know, you, Bigfoot wow. can't 
true, and here's why. But it was so funny because it was published by a uh, university press. I think it was University of Chicago Press. And the, uh, the editor, the associate editor who, who shepherded that project through wrote a, a blurb about it. And she commented in the blurb, and I discuss all this in the review, but she commented in the blurb how it was kind of an interesting process to have this book. She was one of the science editors for University of Chicago Press. Mm -hmm. But she said it was kind of, she was a scientist because there wasn't any science in the book. And I'm wondering too, that is kind of odd. Why would the science editor of university, you know, this prestigious university press, do this. And then she goes, it was hard to find reviewers for the book. We ended up with historians of science and, and uh, folklorists mm. well, get to review the book. Wow. Well, that's a lot, doesn't it? Anyway, so you have that's to be careful about, yeah. uh, about the things that you read. And that's uh, true. Make sure you have a good foundation with the right, right material. Yeah. yeah. Yep. So this is kind of this last question is kind of like uh we're at the fireworks display and at the end it's like pew, 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 you know so oh, i'm curious i have a few topics and i'm curious what your your snap reactions to them are and if there's okay. anything that makes you super comfortable you can say pass super uncomfortable. i'll just i'll i'll yeah. give this to okay. you so you can okay. do that if you want but i'm curious so oh, sure all right here we go um yep. mothman Oh, oh, it's it's curious. I, I don't have enough information, enough personal study to have a uh, informed opinion. Okay. It, uh, I don't equate those types of paranormal phenomenon with mm. what I'm making to gotcha. uh, determine whether there's biological species behind the legend of Sasquatch. So. Okay. Cool. Uh, Van Meter Visitor. You ever heard of it? Who? It's an Iowa cryptid called the Van Meter Visitor. Have you ever heard no, of it? No, I've, ne I've never heard right. of that. It's one. cool. You should check it out. You should check it out. Okay. It's like this like winged pterodactyl terrorized a town oh. in the 1800s. It's pretty cool. Oh. Um, I always bring it up. Anyways, uh, the 1976 movie In Search of Bigfoot. Any thoughts? Oh, sure. That was the one with Leonard Nimoy, right? Was that with Leonard Nimoy or was that with um, Peter Graves? Uh, pff, well, I usually focus on Robert W. Morgan. But no, Nimoy's in it, I, oh, I'm pretty sure. N Nimoy was the host, yeah. But no, and Peter Graves was Mysterious Monsters. That was also a great movie. But yeah, I mean, I, I have, again, uh, memory, I mean, the impact was more substantial now than, than my recollection of the detail. Mm, uh, gotcha. So I, I had uh, Peter Graves, or the, the book that, that was spawned from Mysterious Monsters, the, the documentary. Oh, cool. So awesome. those, those images are a little more uh, am, uh, reinforced. Yeah. No, I like, I like in search of Bigfoot and also the in search of series. Those, I know they're, they're separate, but I like both of them. Right. Um, well, Hey, there's another Star Trek con uh, connection. I've that's been true. I, that's true. I've been introduced by Leonard Nimoy and Jonathan Frakes. Oh, have you really? That's awesome. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> that's so cool. Uh, Ape Canyon attack. Ape Canyon attacks. Is that a, the, the story or the no, the story in 1924 had sure oh yes yeah. well uh, again it's uh, it's kind of an interesting you know how much is historical and how much is historical embellishment okay um, uh, I think it it very likely when you when you kind of winnow through a lot of the the some of the chaff that uh, that something occurred uh, and that they did have encounters I mean why not that that area is prime yeah country and um, so i don't know what motivation they would have i mean i can understand motivation of somebody to prank them potentially to scare them off a claim or to uh, thwart their efforts or something like that but why those individuals would uh, uh, claim such things and and uh, precipitate such ridicule on themselves at that time i mean at that time it was still pretty risky business to yeah and it's so far out there too it'd be yeah. hard to go out and prank them. But I mean, yeah, it's a, such a, such a classic Bigfoot story historically, you know, but yeah. um, Sierra sounds. Sierra sounds are, are, are fascinating. I, I, uh, again, I uh, have had the opportunity to get very well acquainted with, 
Ron Moorhead and mm. and understand him and um it's uh I, I have there's just a couple of reservations that I have and the one the one that uh, still hitches well there's two two one one is the footprints associated with the circumstances mm. interesting um the footprints are not satisfying okay and uh, you know, they, they, in that they, they just aren't anatomically very satisfying is what I mean. They, they're okay. very wedge shaped. Okay. You cannot tell whether you're looking at a right or a left foot. Ah. They're bilaterally symmetrical toes straight across the end. There's no toe angle. There's no differential yeah. toe size. There's no nice big rounded heel. Um, at, at least in the examples that I've seen, now, and I, I can't say if that's exhaustive or not. Sure. The only sure. thing is, is I, I'm, uh, well, I find the vocalizations really interesting. I'm especially intrigued by the whistles mm. because they're, they're, even to my ear, there was the sense of a harmonic as if there was an overtone being created by the, uh, you know, modulation of the pharynx. Okay. And uh, that ties into the potential of extra laryngeal air sacs and uh, you know, and and also associated with that, the the production of infrasound, which I think is a fascinating. Oh topic yeah, right. Totally. Point. But nevertheless, but I don't think I'm. I stop short of acknowledging that there's evidence of language. Okay. I've had some yeah. uh, interesting discussions with uh, Scott Nelson. I still hope we can continue those, um, but he hasn't convinced me of of all of the conclusions that he's drawn from from those vocalizations totally hoping we can get some more involvement with that uh, i keep pushing him to write up some of his findings and and uh, submit them to the relic hominoid inquiry there's another oh, that source would be great listeners um, should should avail themselves out is my my online journal um that i edit and uh, if if we could get those out and involve some other linguists um, commenting and, and dialoguing on that, I think that would be very productive, very fascinating. Yeah, there's such a, the the info on that journal is so cool. Like I had interviewed Dr. Haskell Hart due to an article he has up there. It's very cool. Yep. But uh, yep. last but not least, so last one yep. is: uh, Have you ever heard of Skinwalker Ranch? I have. I've oh. read a little bit. I've okay. had a lot of people send me stuff about it. Okay. I watched a little bit of it on on the. Uh, TV, one of those documentaries, yeah. not, not impressed. Okay. Just not, I, I, I don't, uh, uh, I've any time, uh, you know, I, I, I don't, I don't, uh, dismiss, uh, paranormal phenomena. I, mm -hmm. I, I have just not personally experienced any of the things that are being asserted. Sure. Like that occur on Skinwalker Ranch. And whenever I'm there present, nothing happens, you know, it's, or, or when someone produces documentation of their experience, for example, there was a man who was just trying to convince me that he had been seeing orbs of light. Oh, yeah, I said, well, yeah. have you taken pictures? Well, yes, of course I've taken pictures. Well, there we go. Send me the best example you have of orbs. <laughs> so he, he posted a picture, sent, sent me an email picture. It was a flash photo taken at night. Okay, with yeah. Pollen comes yeah. straight down, and and yeah. he goes, "Look, there's orbs everywhere." I said, "Yeah, that was pollen grains." I've been out there. I've been. We we oh, were yeah. a couple summers ago in uh, Colorado when the big ponderosa pines were were pollinating. You know that pollen ends up being you know inches thick as it blows around on the ground, but as it's flying, you you turn on your uh, your uh, headlight yeah. to go back to your yeah. tent. And you couldn't hardly see. It was like you were in a blizzard. Oh, man. People are interpreting things like that as orbs of light. So wow. the, same thing with Skinwalker Ranch. I mean, I, I'd love to be proven wrong. I yeah. think it'd be fascinating to explore some of those phenomenon. But so far, um, no one's ever provided the pudding. Just to clarify, because I know a few people are going to are gonna ask this. So have you? It, it kind of sounded like you'd been there, but I'm thinking you haven't. No, okay. I just want to clear that up. I've not, okay. not actually been there. Okay, cool. cool. Great. Just, uh, I've been to some, some locations or sites where people have had claimed have had similar okay. experiences and so forth. Gotcha. Gotcha. And I'm, I'm, I'm a stick in the mud, I guess. I'm the party, party pooper. 
That's all right. You're busy enough with all the Bigfoot stuff. So it's like, you know, well. we want you to focus on that, right? It's like, yeah. <laughs> oh man, Dr. Meldrum, this has been like super, super fun. Thank you so much for hanging out. Um, I remember when I first uh, approached you about this, are you still um, uh, okay with staying a few minutes on after the episode? Oh, yes, sure. That's fine. Perfect. Sorry okay. about not checking with that earlier, no, no, no. but yeah. Um remind our listeners uh if this is the first time they've ever heard of you how they can keep up to date with what you're doing what they need to uh, you know i lost you yeah uh oh uh are we back yet oh oh boy hello 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 there you go now you're okay back. we're back we're back yeah thank you for your patience there um yeah right uh remind the listeners how they can best follow um your work, I guess. Yeah. Well, I don't have a web page per se. I do have a okay. Facebook page and I, and I, and I try to post there. There's sometimes some lapses. So my Facebook page, which is under my full name, Don Jeffrey Meldrum. Okay. And, uh, but also I would, again, highly recommend uh, checking out the relic hominoid inquiry. Definitely. Which is at uh, www.isu.edu. So my university, mm -hmm. isu.edu forward slash R H I, or if you just Google relic hominoid inquiry, you'll find it. And, uh, we, you know, we're in our 10th year now, so we've got oh, wow. accumulating quite a number of interesting, um, articles, um, uh, research papers, um, some great historical, um, translations, transcriptions of Mary Jean Kaufman's paper, um, uh, Magner's paper from Mongolia, his, his writings. Sure and so forth there's some great book reviews again so and the book yeah. reviews are not they're they're essay style book reviews so they're really okay. meaty not just well this book was published and it has 200 pages and three figures and a table of contents it goes they go deep into the the topic and oftentimes actually have responses from the authors to the to the uh, oh that's cool yeah, yeah totally so we try to get a lot of comments and, and dialogue going back and forth but but that's a great way to see some really interesting stuff. Awesome. Real thank you. It's been reviewed, peer reviewed. Very good. Very good. Well, thank you again so much for, for coming on tonight, Dr. Meldrum. And thank you yeah. again to all the listeners for hanging out with us. Um, again, Dr. Meldrum is going to hang out for a few extra minutes. Uh, got a few more questions for him, maybe a few more stories. If you want to hear that, you can uh, go to patreon.com forward slash Bigfoot Society support the podcast for uh, $5 a month. But thank you so much for coming on Dr. Meldrum and have a great night.